Today's cool fact of the day is that it takes up to 200 muscles to take a single step. This is Dave Asprey with the Bulletproof Executive. I'm on with Kelly Starrett. Kelly's a pretty amazing guy. He's the founder of a website called Mobility Wad that's really well known around the functional movement area. And he's author of number three Amazon bestseller book, Becoming a Supple Leopard. He's also the founder and owner of San Francisco CrossFit. And he's worked with some of the very top athletes in the world on helping them improve their performance and optimize their movement. Kelly, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so much for having me. You got it, man. We had a chance to talk for a couple minutes before we started recording, so I'm already super stoked for the show. Tell me a little bit about the kind of people you work with. Like, what do you do on a daily basis? Help the audience understand, like, why what you're doing is so big. Well, I think at the the heart and soul is that we have sort of been sold this bill of goods, right? That you need to need to exercise. Just do it. It's gonna be fine. We are living in the middle of a renaissance. It's an epoch of human experience, an epoch of human performance and self-actualization. If we, on the one hand, we have this all of these great thinkers in the space of you know primal nutrition, paleo nutrition, we're we're dialing in. You know, we're getting off ten grams of fish oil. We're drinking some more coconut oil and MCTs. And we're just doing so much better. We're sleeping right. We're drinking more water. And then this other half is we're starting to really figure out what is the best expression of the human physiology. And the reason we've been sold a bill of goods is that what we've been doing forever and ever is we've kind of continued to be leveraging our genetic inheritance. You know that you run until you injure yourself. You lift weights until you herniate a disc. You, you know, what's happened, I mean, if we look at the numbers, the army last year had a million non-combat related orthopedic injuries in, in a year, right? That's 55 million lost user days. 85% of the guys at Marine Force Recon retire on disability. Um, we look at uh, injury rates in ACLs in kids under 12 up 400%. What wow. the heck is going on? Well, what's going on is we have kids who are training harder. We have people who are realizing, hey, I've got to lift weights and run. You know, we're in, we're in a revolution right now in this sort of neutral running or natural running, right? which we call ironically running and uh, but yet people aren't prepared for that and so they're injuring themselves we just we're just kind of basically throwing ourselves against the wall and then wondering what the heck is going on but what's remarkable now is that for the first time we have a large scale almost emergent model like decentralized model where we have information silos repositories being torn down people are talking in my gym alone, and when I, when I mentioned that I own a gym, a San Francisco CrossFit, is that it's my laboratory. You know, this place, we've estimated we've done 80,000 athlete sessions since we've been open. I have nationally, national champion gymnasts next to, you know, world champion powerlifters, next to high level Olympic lifters, next to Ironman, and next to endurance runners, to physios. And so all of a sudden we have this melting pot where we're starting to understand hey, we've worked this out before. We're not the first people who have taken a crack at solving this. The yogis have been talking about the stable shoulder position, arms overhead, for 2,000 years. They weren't aligning the chakra. They just figured out that putting the armpit forward and pushing the hands together made the shoulder more stable. Turns out it's the same stable shoulder position if you're Olympic lifting. It turns out it's the same stable shoulder position of your young gymnast blocking as you do a handstand. So what, what's happening now is finally we're able to sort of connect the dots between human movement and physiology. We have all of this, all of these best practices and strength and conditioning now. You know, it's not uncommon that everyone, like my mom brags about her deadlift PRs and is gluten-free. I mean, like, that's like cats <laughs> sleeping with dogs, right? I mean, this is crazy. So now what's happened is, you know, we've got the nutrition piece. We've got the – we're getting the movement piece and now what I feel like is we've been empowered. We, we've removed the, the rate limiters, the governors between me and living a more self-actualized, pain-free, higher-performance life. And the conversation about injury prevent, prevention, the conversations about pain is the same conversation about performance. But instead of kind of relying on these 
you know, these reactive lagging set of indicators. Well, you know, I run my car until the, you know, blow up my tires and then I change them, right? You just, we need to give people a basic skill set, a tool set to be able to take care of themselves. It's your human right to be able to perform basic maintenance on yourself and it's your responsibility to understand the, how the software works to run the hardware because the hardware is going to be around for a long time now. And I tell you what, I don't want to be 90, you know, and decrepit. I want to be 90 racing a Corvette away from my cops, with my wife next to me, you know, that's what's up. So I, I got to say, uh, my mom can deadlift your mom. Dude, that's, that's <laughs> legit. I mean, that's so legit. Just kidding. <laughs> and, you know, it, you know, it's, it's happening. Like, like really the word's getting out. My mom uses MCT oil every day, right? Like this is how it is. That's right. And it, it's so <laughs> creepy, right? That, uh, you know, that this is, this is what's going on. So what's, what, what's really fun is I think, we're savvy enough now. There's been some kind of tipping point, some kind of change in consciousness where people are aware. I mean, I was at my grocery store and there's like gluten-free life, you know, and I'm like, whoa, 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 there's a magazine about gluten-freeness now. I mean, people have really switched around and have become much more sophisticated and realizing that they have to be at the center. They have to be the low side of control. It's my responsibility to take care of my heart and my brain function and my you know, fasting blood glucose and it's my responsibility responsibility to move correctly and be able to manage the compromises because here's the deal this is this is what's so extraordinary now is that you know if you were a monk and could just you know live at the olympic training center and have this perfect lifestyle and you know be Dara torres and have 10 people massage you all every day i mean that doesn't that's not the real world the real world is i have two kids i run some businesses i have to travel i get compromised i squeeze in my workouts right it's really difficult but now we're starting to have much better practices. So best practice means, boy, I can do the maintenance on myself 15, 20 minutes a day. That's the minimum. I can exercise. I can, that's enough to kind of, you know, undo the compromises that I'm forced in. I mean, all you have to do is fly to the East Coast from the West Coast. And you're like, wow, I'm, I'm a crippled person. I, I'm up and my hips don't work and my back feels terrible and I'm sitting, my ankles are puffy. And you're like, great, I had to do that, you know? Sure, I wear compression. Sure, I'm on the water. Sure, I do all the things I need to do. But at some point, you're going to be compromised because you're a modern human being. We better have a template. And finally, I feel like we've empowered people with this book to be able to say, hey, take care of this. You know, Quit misappropriating your physician. You know, your physician, you, you go see your physician and you know you, you have knee pain and your physician's like, well, let's take a picture. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, it turns out you have a hole in behind your kneecap. You should probably stop running. And you say something like, you're like, what? I express myself through running. You can't keep me down. Like, you're the best doctor ever, right? And the doctor's saying something very reasonable. Like, look, jackass, you wore a hole in a bone that's designed to be 110 years old. Did you think that was a problem? Like, whatever you're doing is not working, but you came into my clinic on fire. I put the fire out, but you, you need swim lessons, bro. So what we need to do is make a better decision. People are getting it. They're getting the message. You know, Mobility Wad has been an insane, we have, you know, couple million unique users it's just it's incredible what's happened and what our model is if we continue to empower people give them the tools to fix themselves they do every single time you know they'll and and how do we know it works we test and retest you know how yeah. do i know that i love the bulletproof coffee well when i ran the bulletproof coffee i felt awesome <laughs> you know what I mean? that's the only thing that matters to me it tasted good that seemed to matter and you know uh, we, we you and i were laughing earlier you know I was like, yeah, I don't have the MCT oil. I'll just run the coconut oil, you know? And uh, and I, of course, just titrated right up to like the big dose and had disaster pants. And, uh, <laughs> but here's, here was my mistake. You had already run that experiment for me. You know, that's what we need to remember is that, hey, people, when we start to sift through these information, right, what we're looking at is like, look, there are really smart people who've run this experiment. One of my uh, buddies is Brian McKenzie, you know, brilliant coach, CrossFit endurance, you know, just a, a natural runner, endurance model guy, you know, and he was like, dude, I know the coconut oil is not doing it for you, but let me make it with the grass fed butter and the MCT oil. And, you know, we, I was like, oh, I get it. I see it, you know, and so, you know, he, you had run that experiment. He just listened to the experiment. Me, I was like, no, I'm going to continue to experiment. And uh, it was a disaster. <laughs> well, Kelly, I, I got to tell you, I'm going to send you a bottle of something new because MCT is six times stronger than coconut oil for energy. I've got a new one of those things that's just coming out of the laboratory basically, ah. but it's 18 times stronger than coconut oil. 
um, and it's it's rocking my brain right now. So I'll send it to you because you're one of those guys who's you know that aware of what's going on in your body that you can tell if there's a difference oh, for you or not. And I tell you, we are. I mean, I'm a coffee snob. Let me just be very <laughs> clear. Coffee, you know, one of the reasons I knew I could trust you was that you were talking to people about making coffee more awesome. Like, I, like right away, I was like, <laughs> I'm in, I'm in, like, this is it. And uh, it's cool, it's really fun. And what's really great is we are seeing, you know, through, through models like Creative Live and Tim Ferriss and, you know, people are, hey, this isn't a gimmick. You know, we have models that we're running that are helping people live. You know, I want to go blast a 5k with my friends on the weekend and then go surf i gotta pick my daughters up and jump in the pool i need to be pain-free i need to not worry about these things and uh and i, I you know i want to look good naked like that's not so unreasonable you know i don't think it's unreasonable at all and i just wanted to thank you for not putting the naked pictures on your website i think well, that, was, that was a positive move <laughs> that's what do we say disasterpants.me <laughs> there's plenty on there there's plenty on there right you, you don't need to see a leopard of that skin it's just not, it's not pretty. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary time. Um, you know, the feedback, you know, if anyone is out there has written a book or taken a creative pro stab at a crop process, it is an ugly, ugly chore. I don't oh, yeah. recommend it. I mean, it's, you know, um, but what's been really fun is this is a really a book of the people and it's a book of my 10,000 hours of experimenting, coaching and teaching reconciling a classic doctoral level physical therapy education with being an athlete with actually working with patients with working with you know teaching moms and dads to squat and you know one of the things you know we've got to do is we our models have to scale you know buckminster fuller had this great concept called mutual accommodation and systems need to be mutually accommodating and one of the things that we're finding now is oh hey well all of this research and science and clinical experience with nutrition actually improves my performance. Not only is it clinically better, like my blood panel looks better, right? When I fractionate my cholesterol, I look better, but also I perform better. It's weird. And so, you know, it's, it's all of these systems, ha you know, I have to, oh, I'm taking care of my tissues. Wow. I'm, my tissues are less brittle and less friable. And, you know, all of these systems have to integrate perfectly. Otherwise, there's someone's got a problem in one of their systems we've got to deal with and get rid of, right? It makes so much sense. In fact, I spent all of last week in London, like going from like large investment bank to large investment bank. I'd give like one to two hour talk about like upgrading human performance. One of the top six things I'm telling bankers, these guys are like the opposite of pro athletes. Most of them are type A, but very few of them are, you know, competitive athlete level. And you know, one of the top six things is do functional movement, like learn how to move your body, learn how to turn your muscles on and off. And a lot of them kind of look at you funny, like, well, wait, like I'm here for the cognitive stuff. But like the, the line between the brain and body is very hard to really distinguish. And what you're doing with functional movement changes cognitive function very oh. dramatically. How about this? The research about bad posture raises cortisol, that sitting causes heart disease. Like, I mean, are you kidding me? The human brain exists. I mean, read Dan, Daniel Coyle's book, right? And look at, you know, skill acquisition is a complex biological process. So I, neurons that fire together, wire together. So I start to map a neural pathway, the oligodendrocytes, the Schwann cells come in and myelinate that thing, turn it from a copper cable into a T1 broadband. Bam, <laughs> right? That's a, that's a biological process. Well, the new research about the brain says, you know, that the brain exists for one reason, to move the human being or the organism through the environment. There's a great TED talk about this. You know, the sponge that moves around and attaches itself to the rock, it has a little nervous system. As soon as it attaches itself to the rock, doesn't need to move, it digests its own nervous system. It turns out cognition is bootstrapped 100% on top of the old brain. That's why it's called the neocortex. Yep. So to somehow disintegrate to pull apart these systems is is our sort of modern reductionist kind of you know ethos which has failed us that this is an integrated system that if I want to upregulate cognition I upregulate movement and this is no wonder that we get kids with a, who like autism who do better with exercise well of course they do those those the brain is an integrated system and that movement aspect of that is vital it is it's not you know it's not an accident that you know Ida Rolf you know fascia queen 
hung out with Moshe Feldenkrais movement guy. It's not an accident yeah. that the yogis were sitting and doing something that looked like yoga, right? It's not an accident. I have a sports psychologist on my staff. I mean, you know, we just we have a, a TV show called Genetic Potential TV, and we just interviewed Mark Allen. You know, um, just the greatest guy, unbelievable triathlete. You know, and what's so interesting is to hear him talk about the hardest aspects were technique, learning to be more efficient. You know, managing the nutrition, he got that ahead. But like the difficulty of the psychology of what he was doing was the limiting factor. And it turned out to be the limiting factor for all the guys he's worked with. You know, uh, all the guys who kind of who have failed and have kind of come around, it's the psychology of this thing. So, you're, you know, you're, you nail this. And what's so interesting for me is when I hear the word functional movement, I'm like, you know what that means to me as a physical therapist? That means you can get up off the toilet. That's great. You can do your bra strap. You can brush your hair. You're functional. I'm into optimal. Can you do everything a human being should be able to do? And I don't mean like at, at Olympic level speeds. Can you squat down with your feet together with your heels on the ground? Yes, no. If you can't, you're not normal. You don't have full potential. You have the mechanisms and the pre-inklings of plantar fasciitis and torn Achilles and knee pain and hip impingement and back. Dude, these are the things a human has to be able to do to express itself why can't you do that? It's one or zero, yes or no. All right, so I have a question for you. We're gonna just zoom right in on this stuff because a lot of movement patterns that people have, especially dysfunctional ones, they happen as you're learning to crawl. Like this is like very low level nervous system wiring stuff before your neocortex is even turned on. So how are you going about like fixing dysfunctional programming that came in way before people had a chance to really think about how they squatted or did anything else? Well, you know, what do, what do we say? The, what's the key to adult learning? It's repetition, right? And so what's great about what's happening in the world is that modern strength and conditioning is like a very formalized language of human movement. It's formal. So if you go into a good gym with a good coach, it turns out that you don't need any more shoulder internal rotation than was required to do a full good power clean. Can you squat? Can you hip hinge, keep your spine neutral, load your hips and ham hamstrings without deviating or having one vertebra do something wonky, and deadlift, which is picking something up off the crib. And so what, we, what we're seeing is that when we come in and drive a brand new motor pattern that's clean, that expresses the actual physiology and biomechanics of the human, the physiology is not debatable. We understand what the best position of the spine is to deadlift 1,000 pounds. We know what it is. We know what the best position for the shoulder is. We know what efficient running looks like because we understand what the biomechanics and the physiology. That's not debatable. The only thing debatable is should I squat two times a week or do I really need to run hills three times a week? I mean that's the only question that we have to, should ever be addressing. So when we take people and what we find is that we have brilliant athletes with monster capacities but that have very, very poor movement skills and they have – we have to rewire them, and in our experience, it takes sometimes 18 months to get someone's butt really working again, right? We have mm -hmm. to rewire that. And it's interesting that that 18 months sort of corresponds to what we know about the fascia, that it takes about 18 months to two years to turn over your fascia in your body. So we start, it's daily practice, we teach perfect mechanics, and then we challenge those perfect me mechanics with load and speed and metabolic demand and chirrespiratory demand. But the bottom line is that we feel like people should be fluent in the language of being a human, and that language of being a human is expressed in the formal language of strength and conditioning. You're saying, hey, you should squat? Totally. Squatting is not an, arch an archetype of, you know, of exercise. It's how my child at age 11 months got up and down off the ground, right? It's how we lower yeah. our center of gravity. I mean, that's squatting, right? You're wired for that. So what we're seeing is that people because of the compromises, we sit, we wear high heel shoes, we've never been taught. We confuse the fact that the car is still running and driving straight with the fact that it's optimally running. And then when something bad happens, we're like, oh, I don't know what happened. I've always run like this. Well, you've always run like an ass. You've always had tight hips. You've <laughs> always healed straight. And it's not your fault. We always say, and this is important, is that people are working at the limits of their understanding. And what we need to do is give them reason to have better understanding. And sometimes that's pain, right? Well, you know, pain is a large motivator. But for us, largely, it's about ego. If we can make you feel better, <clears throat> something changes in your life that will improve. If you run faster or lift more or get better, it, you hit the golf ball longer, guess what? I got gotcha. you. And so we that, end up, yeah, it's the consciousness change. That's it. 
the the mechanism or the model I use for for talking about change on every level, at the end of the day, it comes down to understanding what the ego is doing. The ego is just trying to keep your body from dying. That's right. So it's protecting you. It's making you move poorly because it learned at some point that, wow, if I make this body move in this crappy way, somehow I think I'll be safer. And of course, your ego is full of crap because egos are stupid. But well, you, that, you, that's you, what happens. It's the same way you fail in a boardroom, too. It, it's exactly the same mechanism inside your body. Perfect. And why should it be a different mechanism? And that's what's really exciting is that we have philosophers and designers and we're, you know, we're like, oh, the engineers have worked this out before already. We should be talking about the same processes. You know, kids with damaged motor control systems, right, they have a diagnosis of cerebral palsy. That's what it means to have a, uh, a damaged motor control system. Yet those kids work, learn to walk. They jam their ankle into a collapsed position. They turn the foot out. The knee becomes valgus, like in that ACL tearing position. The hip is impinged, and they overextend. And guess what? That's they leverage the bad mechanics to solve the the problem. And this is where we get, I think, get a little confused, is that the human being is set up for survival, right? It's yeah. like you say, I'm going to survive. And and if you are waiting for pain to say that you're in a good position or bad position, this is a problem because pain and movement, same pathways in the brain, right? So you can't even hear the pain signal when you're moving. This is why when you tweak your shoulder and you lay down in the bed at night, your shoulder starts to throb and you're like, what's wrong with this bed? Well, there's nothing wrong with the bed. What's wrong is that you're not getting any movement signals in your brain. You're only getting pain signals. It's actually worse than being optimized for survival. You're optimized for survival long enough to reproduce and that's it. Bam, you nailed it. So that's that's really the I mean, think about it. You can be injured and you don't even feel it when you're moving. You know, once the adrenaline is going, if you've ever been in a fight, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Right? The guilty pleasure of boxing or fighting is that you don't feel pain right away. You feel pain afterwards. So once the adrenaline is going, or once I'm moving, or God forbid I'm a a legit executive athlete who's type one, right? Who has practiced down regulating pain signals. And so suddenly I don't even hear the signals that my body's telling me because I'm so out of touch. I, I'm inflamed. I don't move correctly. And then boom, something blows up in my face. And, you know, and it's because we don't sort of understand that the human is such remarkable engineering that is designed to get the job done long enough versus, hey, we have a blueprint now that says you should be pain free your whole life and you should be able to be as functional as you want to be your whole life. You know, there's no reason why you shouldn't continue to get better and better and better. No reason. It's certainly been my path. And but here's a question, kind of a personal one. I had arthritis in both my knees when I was 14. Yeah, gee, I wish someone had told me that gluten and liquid squeezed margarine were contributors to that kind of problem. Um, but this was an issue. And now I've got a screw in my knee. I've got no ACL. I've had, you know, three surgeries to fix cartilage. And I have just about no knee pain. It, it's extremely unusual for it to happen now, even though it was a constant part of my life when I was in my 20s. But you must get a lot of people in your gym who either have had like surgical intervention or like they've been walking with flat feet for 25 years. How far can you move someone who's just that completely broken from you know, the way that they, that they would have moved if they were moving naturally? Like where's the line of, of – where's the edge there? How far can you move someone? Well – our experience is, to your point, is that, hey, I, I move beyond pain, yes, no, right? And I move into, well, how much function is, am I capable of? Can I, can I continue to develop enough function? So, for example, yesterday, we're doing, we're push pressing in our gym, right? Which is using your legs to jump a weight over your head, basically, into a stable shoulder position. And there's a guy who has a plate in his chest, right? He was in a bad accident. They split him open, put a put a plate on his chest. He cannot hold a bar in the front rack. So he can't power clean. He can't front squat. But you know what? I've got other bars around. I can still t have him squat upright. He can push prep from behind the neck, right? Push press behind the neck. We have enough tools that says, okay, so if I have 150 movements, if you give me 50 movements, that's probably still enough. And what we still see is that people are terrible at the basics. And so what we don't know per individual what's possible, but what I do know is, are you still inflamed? No. Have you optimized your movement? Because that's not a that's not an iffy thing. That's let's optimize your movement. And what we find is that you know people get a little bloody spot on their knee, but when I get them moving better, they get off of that bloody spot. They start to normalize those movements. Your knee with a lot of meniscus that means that you're susceptible to loading. 
you know? So we don't do a lot of box jumping, for example, right? But we try to keep your shin vertical to minimize the shear on the knee. I have so much richness in the modern program, and there's so many things we can do to kind of eke out your genetic potential that it's not a worry. So, you know, it's a slower process for some people who come in, but remember the gym is your laboratory. It's the place not to exercise. It's the place to be running diagnostics on yourself day after day after day. Here's the things I can't do. Oh, I found another problem. Now I can address it. And so when we start looking at it that way, this becomes a place of intense, deep practice. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? And so, you know, this isn't just, hey, cardio protective, have some muscles. That's good for you. This is, hey, well, this is where we really get to the bottom. And sometimes we don't know what the bottom is. You know, my young swimmers, uh, we worked with a uh, college swim team that won the WAC championship, right? I got a whole, we got a whole team of swimmers through the season. They were champions and not a girl, single girl had shoulder pain. But some of those girls had collapsed, horrible feet. And, you know, the first couple of weeks are like, my feet are cramping all the time. And I'm like, well, look, it's because your feet are so weak in these positions. At the end of the season, they're taller, they're, their pushes off the wall are better. And really it comes down to we understand we experimented on this generation of people with nutrition and movement. And unfortunately, some of us paid the price for that. But guess what now? We have better models. And because your body – is so such a remarkable healing machine and normalizing machine that if we get you into managing the lifestyle plus moving better, whoosh, you know we don't know what's possible. This has been my experience for sure, and one of the things you have to have is the right building blocks. I know that to replace the cell membranes in the body, you've got to be eating the high fat diet with the right kinds of fats like the the coconut and the butter and the MCT oils and all. But for fascia and all, I mean, I, I've been focusing on collagen lately as a major part of what I'm doing. Do you have any specific recommendations for people who are trying to basically do the fascia turnover trick? It's going to take a year and a half, but maybe it'll take less time or it'll happen better if you load your system with the right building blocks. Like, what are you doing for that? Well, we advocate a, you know, gluten-free whole food. That's table stakes, gluten free. Like, if, if you're listening to this, you're not gluten free. Like, you're sort of missing it. That's right. And you know, so we're saying, hey, like, probably should pull all the grains. Should probably eat as many vegetables. Our, our, we kind of have this joke. We, we call it the soy free vegan <laughs> plus meat. That's our model. So you're a soy free vegan plus meat. Great. You're. Let's talk. You know, like, are you eating more pounds of spinach and field greens and as many root vegetables? Great. You know, I like what Mark Sisson has a very model, simple model. Hey, you probably. Most days you don't need more than 100 grams of carbohydrate, maybe 150. Yeah. You add enough carbohydrate back if you're exercising, right? So what we do is we, there are really good guidelines from Sisson and Wolf and, and all of those folks who, are, who have done the thinking, right? Cordain, all these guys, we really appreciate their model. Plus, we really have taken – we've gotten so much more serious about our fats. I don't eat yeah. a lot of nuts anymore, for example. It just turned yeah. out I don't, I don't do well with nuts. Macadamia nut is the only nut in my life. Everything else is avocado and some kind of, you know, coconut oil. I find that on uh, that's pretty much identical to the bulletproof recommendations. Like you got to go heavier on the fat and more picky on the fats. Like the nut, the nut oils just aren't for optimal human performance. You'll survive, but you won't thrive. That's right. And you know, you know, the zone. Think about when that thing came out, right? I mean, I was like, oh, almonds and cottage cheese and bananas. Like I was like, I'm in there. And I was like, holy crap! Like 17 pounds of gum, you know, <laughs> nuclear, <laughs> nuclear waste on the uh, bananas, glycemic bomb, and then almonds. Like I did not thrive on that that little prescription. It, it, you know why? You know why the zone was was made that way? Because the most you could do in a bar was 40, 30, 30. If you wanted to make it portable, you could not put more fat in a bar and not have like a mush bar. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and it, you know, it was completely like if you talk to Sears, you know, he was like, ah, I never intended for it. Like, the second you started getting under control about what you were eating, he upped the fat a ton. You know, that was the mistake, yeah. right? So we really say, hey, look, this is how a human beings should eat. And, and all, I love the old naturopaths. They're like, dude, how long have we been saying this? You know, they're like, if it's white or if it doesn't rot, don't eat it. You know, if, you, if your grandpa didn't uh, like identify it as food, it's probably not food. You know, <laughs> eat more food. Eat a ton of vegetables, you know, play with a little fruit every once in a while because pineapple is amazing, you know, but uh, you probably don't need it every day. And then we've already set the stage for optimal healing. Now let's talk about the other big pieces. Are you sleeping enough? So I, I have some friends who are ninjas in the Navy, right, who basically are night monkeys, night ninjas, 
and it they're sleep deprived and it trashes them. It trashes their testosterone. It tra- and so we start looking at the other variables. Are you drinking enough water? Are you sleeping, trying to go to bed at the same time every night? Are you getting up at the same time every night? You know, we talked about Mark Allen won his last triathlon, the world championship at age 37. And I was like, well, how did you do that and be injury proof? He's like, I didn't have any injuries. Mate. He's like, I was a sleeping machine. I was like, well, how much is that? He's like, nine to 11 hours a night plus a nap. That's what it took. Anything less than that, and I fell apart. And if we really bear down on that for people and say, well, are you setting the conditions for optimization of your system, then we really start to get to the nuts and bolts. And we see a lot of sort of misplaced precision. I'm like, I don't care what you're measuring if you're not eating right, if you're not exercising, if you're not sleeping and not drinking actual water, then then it's still a lie. So what will happen is if we get you loading correctly, then we can remap the pattern. It's not just turn your fascia over. It's turn your fascia over into a better position. It takes seven years to turn your entire skeleton over, but it's not an accident that we take pictures of at six months, at 18 months, at two years, and people look radically different, even on radiograph, on x-ray, because – their bodies are moving differently. They've realigned the fascial patterning. They, the muscle attachment is slightly remodeled into a more effective position. Your body is a constant, brilliant adaptation machine. That's what it'll do. It'll adapt. You can, dude. I know world champion Olympic lifters, a world champion kayakers, gold medalists who would, who would smoke once in a while. You know, like does that make any sense? Not really. But they're still the best in the world, so screw it. You know, versus well, how much better can we get? We know what that looks like. It's very simple. It's hard to do in reality sometimes, but the prescription is simple for tissue health. It's simple for organ regulation. It's simple for these things. Simple. You said something pretty important there, you know, that you know, bone turnover sort of thing. When I work with my clients, I talk about how the body doesn't really exist. It's, an, it's like an eddy in a river because you're constantly shedding cells and adding new cells. So even though it looks and feels pretty damn solid and you can see it in the mirror and you can whack it, um, second by second, it's different. It's just you don't see that speed of change, and that's why you can repattern almost anything because it, you know there, there, it's a flow through time and space full of various minerals and you know, various other building blocks, mostly carbon and water. A hundred percent, and no wonder we like. Well, can we do this with our brains and our thinking and our patterning? Sure. It's called you know it's called discipline, right? It's called practice, and what so much of what I'm advocating for is. So much of the practice, look at this, 350 years ago, there's a great Japanese sword fighter named you know, Musashi, right, who book, wrote the Book of the Five Rings, it's so famous, pioneered fighting with two swords. 350 years ago, he's like, hey, your combat stance is your everyday stance. You know, there's no difference between going into combat and standing. It's the same thing. So why are you making it different things? You know, he said, from your, where your short sword goes, your belly needs to be firm. You know, that was his language for like, what, you, you should have a braced spinal position a little bit all the time, you should hang on the meat. And he's like, from your knees to your feet, you should have right tension in the foot. Well, I, I think this is what's so fun is that we can get people starting to think about putting all the work in because you can be optimizing these positions when you're standing. You squat maybe 200 times a day. Well, and that squat really well 200 times a day. You squat to the toilet, to the car, to the chair, to the boardroom, like squat perfectly. You know, what are you doing? You know, just like you have sort of advocated for, hey, don't make this nutrition thing the elephant in the room. Just work it into your daily construct. When we see people with better posture, they get organized through the shoulder before they start typing, you know, they don't have as much mouse shoulder pain. So what we're trying to do is, hey, look, you can bury these concepts into the work, into your daily life, because it's just the same expression as exercise. And who you are right now is who you are right now. And, and to your point, you can always change. It's it's shocking. It it is. It, it's for me been amazing because you know, I've lost a hundred pounds and I've changed my IQ and I I literally don't even look like the same person that I You're was not. eighteen years ago. And it's it's exactly right. You know, there's two two full skeletal turnovers along the way, and it's it's awesome. And when people hear this podcast, we'll get some guys. You know, early twenties. You're really focused and, and just you're wanting to kick more ass and, and still drinking beer, still eating pizza. And you know what? If, if you're going to drink, pick vodka because it's less toxic than the beer. But but it doesn't – it's not apparent. I wish I had known this when I was when I was younger. But it's just not apparent what's going to happen You know, 20 years down the line if you keep doing the crap like that. 
and maybe legitimately, I mean, I think you're about my age, Kelly. You know, you and I could say no one told us this crap when, when we were kids because we didn't really have the, the Internet and the cloud and all that stuff. But if you're listening to this now, you're probably getting it over your iPhone. You've got access to more info than anyone ever did in the previous generation. And if you don't use it, you're kind of a chump. Well, what's uh, <laughs> truth? Truth. <laughs> I totally agree. It's so it's so easy, and it's um and it's remarkable. And I don't think people realize how crappy they feel, and I don't realize how much more they can you know achieve, and how much better they can get, and and how much like suffering they can put away. I mean, my. You know, my kids get out of the hot tub and they're like, Dad, my feet, my footprints are straight, you know, and they, they know to stand correctly, you know, and they don't walk like ducks. And why? Because that's, that's what humans do. And so, you know, my daughter will come home and be like, dude, you should have seen what that girl had for lunch today. And I was like, yeah, it's pretty bad, huh? And she's like, yep. And it's not that we're, we perseverate on food, but she just knows what humans eat and what they don't eat, you know? And so that, that's the problem is that we, um, we didn't know. Now we know. You have so much access to it. Make some small changes. This book is the book that I had wished I had had when I was 17, you know, when I was 16, when I became meta aware. Yeah. We tried to create the Betty Crocker cookbook. This book is for my Olympians. Honestly, it's for my mom. It's for, it's for people who need a basic template to say, oh, oh, I sit on the chair like that. Oh, I, okay. This is a better position. And the system is so so ripe for upregulating. You're just an upregulating machine that when you start to upregulate a little bit, wow, wait to see what happens. It's incredible. Well, I, I can tell you, uh, I'll be recommending your book to my clients. I just had a chance to read it in the last couple of days. And yeah, if you're if you're listening to this, you should check out the book. I mean, Becoming a Supple Leopard is that cookbook. And it's it's something that you could spend 20 years, you know, getting a degree in physical therapy and, and working with people to learn it. Or you can basically say, I'm going to learn from the experts. I'm going to take a shortcut. I'm going to cheat. And even if you only do 80% of the stuff in there, fine. You got a huge amount of the advantage and maybe you'll do more. Maybe you won't. But if you're not doing any of that stuff, you're kind of missing out. Well, and, you know, I'm trying to teach people that, uh, you know, if you don't show up with your physician, your physical therapist, your chiropractor and saying, here are the 10 things that I've done already. Here's what I think the problem is. I mean, you don't deserve to be get help. You know what I mean? <laughs> Take a crack at it. And, and what you're going to see is that 90% of the time you'll probably solve your own problems, which, I mean, is a – is a social medicine revolution. I mean, if we, the, you know, you are at the heart of taking care of yourself, and and it's so simple. You know, taking a, a three hours off from your work to go make a physician's appointment to go see a fit. Like all you needed to do was figure out that like you know your rectus femoris is stiff, and you could probably voodoo floss above your super patellar pouch. Like this is easy, bam, and you fix it, and uh, and it's your human right. You know, this this is why. What's so great about podcasts and the, the conversation happening between experts right now is, you know, people are really have gotten out of the mindset that, you know, this is proprietary information. I'm not I'm not sharing, you know, my best model that we're finally showing everyone, hey, this is what we think is the best. Here's how we've tested it. Try it. Let me know. Give me some feedback. Yeah, it, it's the model and you can do it in so many different ways. It, it turns out too. Not only is it taking that three hours to go to the doctor, you might get five minutes depending on what doctor you go to and all. And and most of the really high end uh, physicians and healing professionals that I've worked with in the last couple of years, they're really seriously like either not taking insurance or thinking about not taking insurance, and they have a half hour minimum visit for repeat visitors and you know, repeat customers or clients or patients, or even an hour minimum because they don't want to they don't want to waste their time they don't want to mess around the, the whole point is their time because they spent 20 years studying this should be fine tuning not basics that's right yeah. that's right and uh, you know we we don't have to we don't have to argue about you know what you're topping the salad with are you eating salad yes or no you know this is this is it so you know we're, it's such an exciting time and there's so many bright thinkers in the world of space of human optimization right now and and what we really want I want people to get back to their lives you know like you can be a, a crazy food person and you can you know make make paleo your your habit but really ultimately after seven years of that you're just going to come back and you'll be like oh yeah this is the way we eat this is the way my children eat you know what's really important is my work what's really important is spending more time on the beach with my kids what's really important is 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 getting rid of the other things so I can express myself as a human being. And, uh, you know, we're, it's, it's so simple 
that I, I mean, I sound I sound ridiculous saying that, but just because it, you know people have been so kind of disconnected from this information, but you really can run faster, jump higher, lift more, feel better, not have knee surgery. It's remarkable. All right, so let's talk specifics. What about stretching? Like everyone knows, you know, from the '70s jogging, you know, revolution, if you can call it that. Okay, stretching is supposed to be good for you, and you say in your book pretty straightforwardly that it doesn't work and it leads to injury. That's going to be news even for people uh, on this podcast. Tell me well, why. Well, let's define stretching. What do you mean? Like, I just put, like I'm pulling on a passive tissue system. So when we typically say stretching, we're talking about the muscular system, right? That's usually what we're saying. Oh, I have a tight muscle, I'll pull on it. And if you think about your calves, for example, like the classic calf stretch, you know, you put your foot up on the wall and you stretch your calves, you know, and you feel a pull there, it's stretching, something's pulling and feel tension, right? Well, the real issue is that calf is designed to take maybe 10,000, 5,000 loads a day. An average person will take 10,000 steps a day, so we have 5,000 background insidious loads on it. Plus, we'll add uh, all the, you know, if you're a runner, that's, you know, 400 meters, that's 330 steps. So 800 meters, you're taking 330 other loads on that calf. Do you think that I weigh 230 pounds? Do you think that me pulling my, putting my calf up and pulling some tension in it for 30 seconds or even two minutes is going to change anything? No. And what we've seen is the muscular system is a neuromuscular system. It has software that runs it. And so it's like, you know, pushing the car to try to jump start it, but you never turn the ignition on, you know, to, to, to actually put electricity into the system. What we've found is that by the time we address the sliding surfaces of the tissues, right, how the stiffness is, how the tissues are interrelating and intrarelating, we've addressed the joint capsule, right, with the joint capsules of your body. You're moving better. By the time I've hit those other three things, the muscle doesn't isn't even short or even a problem anymore and so what we've been sold is sort of like hey let's take this one approach we know like well i'm taking the i'm taking the mct oil i don't understand what nothing's changed well you're still eating 16 pounds of cookies and you're not sleeping of course it doesn't change we have to take a systems approach so you'll notice that i use the word mobilization i'm mobilizing a position and i think where people get confused sometimes about all this thing is we're like what do i do well here's the deal do you can you do the things a human being should do? I.e., are you a skilled human? You know, do you have full potential of your tissues? Can you put your arm straight up over your head with your armpit in a good position without breaking your back? Right? That's it. And if you can't, then what I'm advocating for is to use these mobilizations as skill transfer exercises so that we 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 use these tools to improve a position and suddenly stretching in quotation marks has context what i'm looking for is the the efficiency the stiffness of the system and its end ranges and our hypothesis is that if if i deal with your stiffness plus make sure that you're a skilled human i.e you can express all the things that a human should be able to do can you squat down with your feet together heels on the ground yes or no if you can't that's the problem and that's the root cause of so many of the over tension problems we see the tendonitis the tendinosis the tearing and the default reactionary problems of me working around the working around that restriction which is the torn acl and the torn meniscus and the herniated disc and so if we move beyond stretching and we start making this put it back in the context of actual movements People see the difference, they express the difference, and we move away from press and guess, which is kind of classic what we've been doing in stretching. It doesn't work. Well said. We're coming up towards the end of our, our interview here, and there's a couple questions that I want to make sure that I ask you. And one is a question that I've asked every guest on the show ever, and that is, what are the top three things, like three pieces of advice you have for people uh, who want to outperform when it just you know kick more ass this doesn't have to be you know anything in your book it can be something in your book but in your your time as a human being what are the three most important things you've learned so the first first piece is deal with your nutrition like be serious about it you know you have enough slack in there to have a piece of cheesecake once in a while but be good it really makes a difference number two and and hydration is part of that Number two, you've got to sleep. You are not a special flower. 
we know what happens when you don't go when you don't sleep for long periods of time we know what happens it's you can buffer that and you're lying to yourself and you will disintegrate you will implode sleep and three is stop thinking about exercise as exercise think about it as a way of teaching the being a skilled human and as a side effect of being able to be a skilled human you'll become fitter as a side effect of being a skilled human you'll become stronger and think about this as an intellectual exercise that running isn't just putting my headphones on and sprinting out it's about hey running is the most one of the most technical things we teach people i'm going to need teachership and coaching go find a coach go you you cannot do it in the gym by yourself you need to be in a in a community of people who are training together just like you did in high school those three things make such a big difference if i could add a fourth i would say get yourself some kind of lacrosse ball and start dealing with your stiff tissue like it is not magic put that ball where it hurts above and below where it hurts and start dealing with your tissue because you're, you're it's it's ridiculous how stiff you are very awesome advice and I, I wish we'd had a little more time on the show to go into uh optimal sleep length um you mentioned like nine to eleven hours is look like that, the new diurnal patterning you people were talking about. Oh, I sleep four hours. I get up. I sleep more four hours. Yeah. Look, you need to be rested. Yeah, which I, I means think that's what, a bad idea. <laughs> that's right. Like so, you know, go to bed at the same time, and you should wake up at the same time. You should not need an alarm clock to wake up because you're rested, right? Yeah. That's the model. What do people say if you fall asleep under five minutes, you're you're sleep deprived? I mean, I black out in thirty seconds. You know, how about this? When you travel. The sleep researchers at Stanford say it takes an entire day to make up every hour of time travel. When I go to the East Coast and come back, I look pre-diabetic. You miss one night's sleep, you're pre-diabetic for the next 24 to 48 hours, and you're 30% immune compromised. It's that serious. Well, well, that's not taking into account how much exercise and what supplements and what food you took and what you know what color glasses you wore. Like, there's a lot you can do to optimize sleep. That's right, 100%. Yeah. So. So be working on it, you know, and you're, you're the greatest experiment of your life. And the uh, only thing that matters is test, retest. Do you feel better? Yep. How do, you know, we, we advocate for athletes to get a full blood panel regularly, like a real blood panel, not like, oh, yeah, your cholesterol. Like, look at your cholesterol, fractionate it. What's your homocysteine? Like, start asking the conversations. Because how do we measure diet and nutrition? You know, nutrition and lifestyle? Through blood. So, yep. you know, you've got to be looking at those things. Otherwise... You're just guessing. You know, I'm, I'm just making a cake. I hope it comes together. How do we know what we know? We test and retest. You're exactly right on that front. And our, our recommendations on blood testing, I think, line up enormously. The bottom line is if, if you just took you know, an hour to listen to this whole discussion here, you owe it to yourself to get a baseline. What's your data? Like, like how's your body doing? You know, do a functional movement analysis. Like, understand what are your weak points? What are your strong points? And then figure out, are you happy with where everything is? Is everything working great? If so, hallelujah. But if you're like 99% of the people <laughs> listening to this, you're, you're, you know something's wrong. Either you're in denial or you feel helpless, like you can't do anything. And the truth of the matter is that if you're in denial, you can fix that too. Uh, and you're not helpless. And some of this stuff, like in three days, people can turn off half their inflammation if they make the right changes. It's just doable. Amen. Uh, and and it, it, it's not voodoo. It really is. It's observable, measurable, repeatable phenomenon. And you don't have to become an expert in it because we've run the experiments for you. We have. Yeah. You know, there's so, there's so much good advice out in the world right now. Follow a couple people, make some simple changes, and uh, be prepared to be wowed. I mean, you know, it's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> on, on that note, uh, I'm definitely following you, Kelly. Um, you are uh, one of the top guys in functional movement. I appreciate your work very much. Tell me where I can get all of your different sites. Give me your URLs. Give me your book title again so everyone can get this down. It's going to be in the show notes uh, here on Bulletproof Radio too. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, you can find us on mobilitywad.com. The site is uh, – we have kind of two sites. This I have 550 free videos that are searchable and tagged. You can look for your problem. And then we have a pro user site, daily programming, a little bit more technical for the pro user. But the our – our gift to the universe is like, here's 550 videos. We'll keep posting of things that you should know because it's sometimes easy to see it in a real form. The book, Becoming a Supple Leopard, is uh, available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your local bookstore. It's everywhere. People have been so generous about it. Uh, we're blown away. You know, you write a textbook about movement 
And, uh, you know, when it beats David Sedaris and Michael Pollan, you know, and it's a $60 textbook about a Betty Crocker cookbook, it's, it's mind blowing. So uh, that's out there right now. And if you happen to be in San Francisco, come see us. We're at San Francisco CrossFit in the Presidio. Wonderful. Thanks again, Kelly. Have an awesome day. And I appreciate the knowledge you shared today. Thanks, you guys. Today's cool fact of the day is that it takes up to 200 muscles to take a single step. This is Dave Asprey with the Bulletproof Executive. I'm on with Kelly Starrett. Kelly's a pretty amazing guy. He's the founder of a website called Mobility Wad that's really well known around the functional movement area. And he's author of number three Amazon bestseller book, Becoming a Supple Leopard. He's also the founder and owner of San Francisco CrossFit. And he's worked with some of the very top athletes in the world on helping them improve their performance and optimize their movement. Kelly, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so much for having me. You got it, man. We had a chance to talk for a couple minutes before we started recording, so I'm already super stoked for the show. Tell me a little bit about the kind of people you work with. Like, what do you do on a daily basis? Help the audience understand, like, why what you're doing is so big. Well, I think at the the heart and soul is that we have sort of been sold this bill of goods, right? That you just need to exercise. Just do it. It's going to be fine. We are living in the middle of a renaissance. It's an epoch of human experience, an epoch of human performance and self-actualization. If we, on the one hand, we have this all of these great thinkers in the space of you know primal nutrition, paleo nutrition. We're we're dialing in. You know, we're getting off ten grams of fish oil. We're drinking some more coconut oil and MCTs. And we're just doing so much better. We're sleeping right. We're drinking more water. And then this other half is we're starting to really figure out what is the best expression of the human physiology. And the reason we've been sold a bill of goods is that what we've been doing forever and ever is we've kind of continued to be leveraging our genetic inheritance. You know that you run until you injure yourself. You lift weights until you herniate a disc. You, you know, what's happened, I mean, if we look at the numbers, the Army last year had a million non-combat related orthopedic injuries in, in a year, right? That's 55 million lost user days. 85% of the guys at Marine Force Recon retire on disability. Um, we look at uh, injury rates in ACLs in kids under 12 up 400%. What wow. the heck is going on? Well, what's going on is we have kids who are training harder. We have people who are realizing, hey, I've got to lift weights and run. You know, we're in, we're in a revolution right now in this sort of neutral running or natural running, right? which we call, ironically, running. And, uh, but yet people aren't prepared for that. And so they're injuring themselves. We just, we're just kind of basically throwing ourselves against the wall and then wondering what the heck is going on. But what's remarkable now is that for the first time, we have a large-scale, almost emergent model, like a decentralized model where we have information silos, repositories being torn down. People are talking. In my gym alone, and when I, when I mentioned that I own a gym, a San Francisco CrossFit, is that it's my laboratory. You know, this place, we've estimated we've done 80,000 athlete sessions since we've been open. I have nationally, national champion gymnasts next to, you know, world champion powerlifters, next to high level Olympic lifters, next to Ironman, and next to endurance runners, to physios. And so all of a sudden we have this melting pot where we're starting to understand hey, we've worked this out before. We're not the first people who have taken a crack at solving this. The yogis have been talking about the stable shoulder position, arms overhead, for 2,000 years. They weren't aligning the chakra. They just figured out that putting the armpit forward and pushing the hands together made the shoulder more stable. Turns out it's the same stable shoulder position if you're Olympic lifting. It turns out it's the same stable shoulder position of your young gymnast blocking as you do a handstand. So what, what's happening now is finally we're able to sort of connect the dots between human movement and physiology. We have all of this, all of these best practices and strength and conditioning now. You know, it's not uncommon that everyone, like my mom brags about her deadlift PRs and is gluten-free. I mean, like, that's like cats <laughs> sleeping with dogs, right? I mean, this is crazy. So now what's happened is, you know, we've got the nutrition piece. 
We've got the, we're getting the movement piece. And now what I feel like is we've been empowered. We, we've removed the, the rate limiters, the governors between me and living a more self-actualized, pain-free, higher performance life. And the conversation about injury prevention, the conversations about pain is the same conversation about performance. But instead of kind of relying on these, you know, these reactive lagging set of indicators. Well, you know, I run my car until the, you know, blow up my tires and then I change them, right? You just, we need to give people a basic skill set, a tool set to be able to take care of themselves. It's your human right to be able to perform basic maintenance on yourself and it's your responsibility to understand the, how the software works to run the hardware because the hardware is going to be around for a long time now. And I tell you what, I don't want to be 90, you know, and decrepit. 